Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Dr. Garnisa's House of Religion, Magic, and Conjure. As you see, I got a new setup here, so just messing with the camera a little bit. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining me. And I wanted to come on again, you know, fairly quickly. Uh, things are happening so fast now. It's like we have whiplash because things are happening so fast. Um, and what I want to do is continue the conversation that I've been having based upon certain books that are, you know, really important for our time right now. Last time, you know, I, I talked about Baldwin and The Fire Next Time, and I absolutely 100,000% recommend you get that book and read that book. Today, I want to talk about Black Liberation Theology and James Cone, who was the father of Black Liberation Theology. And it could be that you've never heard of Liberation Theology or James Cone. Today, that changes. And I know a lot of us on this particular channel are not don't identify as Christian and that's fine but you know one of the things we talk about here is religion and so I want people to know people who moved away from Christianity even that there is this revolutionary aspect to Christianity and James Cone highlighted that so when we talk about black liberation theology we're talking about a form of, of theology of Christian identity that says we recognize that God is the God of the oppressed. Liberation theology says God is the God of the oppressed. God is always on the side of the underdog. And how do we know that? So Christian theologians say, well, if you look at the Bible, you look at the stories of the Bible, God always comes to the side of the oppressed. The people, the Hebrew people who were in slavery, um, who were freed from slavery from Pharaoh, right? God, God raised up Moses to to liberate people. God raised up prophets to liberate people. And that's, that is what the entire Bible is really about. It's a particular people story, right? A Jewish people story talking about how God rescued them when they were underdogs over and over and over and over again. God continues to rescue them. And then you get to the New Testament and you get Jesus as that prophet who is the one to liberate people from all kinds of systemic oppression, right? So people forget that Jesus was a revolutionary figure and that's why he was executed by the state. So contemporary Christians can do all kinds of things and, and, and make it seem like Jesus just came to die for your sins and all that. And that's why many of us have, are not Christian. Um, but when you look at who Jesus was as a historical person, and so some people want to say, well, he, well, he didn't really exist. The man Jesus existed. This thing called Christianity is something else, right? But we have record that this man Jesus existed and that this man Jesus was crucified. We have, we have record of that outside of the Bible. So if we could just put that aside. The record we have of Jesus and his brothers is that he was a revolutionary. Right, so he was executed by the state. So, so black liberation theology says we recognize that God is always liberating oppressed people. And any version of that religion that tells you that that's not what God was doing is false. So James Cone, father of black liberation theology, starts writing this type of theology in 1970 on the heels of the civil rights movement and the black power movement. He's an African, I think obviously to you, a black uh, Christian minister, also theologian, scholar, academic, in his seminary, Union Theological Seminary in New York City, looking around him as the cities are on fire, much like what we're experiencing now. The uprisings, right? We're fed uprisings. People are fed up, fed uprisings. And so he was literally looking out on his world the way we're looking out at our world seeing a very similar kind of situation. And he said, I cannot stay in my ivory tower and pretend that I'm doing God's people a, uh, any form of justice if all I'm going to do is stay in here. I must write what's on my heart. I must remind people that God is the God of the oppressed. I must remind people that God is black. God is on the side of black people here now. So this was his first book. A Black Theology of Liberation. Now, this is the 20th anniversary edition of it, so if you look for it, you may find a different cover. 
by James H. Cone, and Cone died a couple years ago. And for those of us who do black religion, who are academics and professors of black, uh, well, of any black scholar really doing uh, study and teaching in the field of religious studies or theology, owes a debt of gratitude to, to James Cone. And we all acknowledge him as such. We all acknowledge him as basically the grandfather of our whole movement. I couldn't be here doing what I do had it not been for James Cone doing what he did. He is among the ancestors now. So we appreciate what James Cone did for us in breaking down barriers and talking truth to power, talking to his own white colleagues who didn't want to hear about God being black, didn't want to hear about anything called black theology. They told him there can be no black theology. That can't be a real thing. You can't make God black. They told Cone and he said, watch me. I will, I will write theology that addresses the needs of my people. I will write theology, which was really at that time, really this construct of European philosophers and, and theologians, Euro-American philosophers and theologians, right? And he said, I will take that version and I will make it for my people. And that's another one of his books that he wrote called For My People. I will do it. I will be in these white spaces of academia and in these schools and I will I will craft it because God is on the side of the oppressed and the, the oppressed people that he was talking about were black people, black American people. So black liberation theology was born in 1970 um, with the publication of this book. Um, so I wanted to read uh, a bit of it. And also what I should say is, what I decided to do in terms of any sort of class is I've decided to have a, um, a reading group, you know, where we can dive into some, some of these teachings more deeply than I'm doing on these videos. So for those of you who, who want to do that, let me know. I'm going to put up a page where you can, um, well, it'll be kind of like Zoom, but it's another, another platform similar to, to Zoom. And I'm going to start putting up that post, that page, in our community page here on the channel. I'll make another video and just start promoting it. Maybe give chance, people a chance to get various books or not. I mean, you don't have to have the book or you can have the ebook version, Kindle from Amazon or something. But you know, you can follow along, but if you have the book, you wanna read the book, then you have a little bit of time to get the book. Because it, this is important and it, it's important for me as a religion scholar, it's important to me as a person who you know who's making these videos right as i'm talking about religion magic and conjure here's the religion part here's what here's how religion makes a difference in our lives here's where religion can fail us also when it doesn't right one of my colleagues eddie cloud who i mentioned before out of princeton he said the black church is dead in 2010 he said the black church is dead and and what he meant by that i made a video about that what he meant was if the black church doesn't have its prophetic edge, it's not telling the truth and not speaking truth to power, then it's dead. Because ever since its inception on the plantation, its goal was to liberate and to speak truth to power. And so if you ever get to a point where you have a black church that's more concerned about where the ministers are concerned about the size of their congregations and you know whatever they're wearing and their money, then that black church is dead because it's not prophetic it's not doing anything to improve the lives of, of people. So that was his, his statement then. So I am of the mindset as a religion scholar that now is a really good time to, to re-educate people or maybe just educate people for the first time about the importance of how, of, of the role that religion plays in our lives. It's easy to dismiss it, but how is it, how has it lasted this long, right? Even something like black Christianity, black religion in general, how has it lasted? And so Cone says in his other book, which I also want to talk about, this video might be a little long. He's got a book called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And in that book, well, in interviews I've heard him do, he said, in this book, I wanted to say everything that my 
that my poor black parents in Arkansas could never say to white people. He grew up in Arkansas. Uh, he said, I wanted to be able to speak to black, to, to, I wanted to be able to tell the truth to white people for all the black people who could never say what they really wanted to say. And he said, so here I am in my privileged position as a black man with a PhD, and I wanted to speak for them. I wanted to take off the mask that we end up wearing in front of white people, and I wanted to say what's real, what's true. And he said, I wanted to be a witness also with that book as to how it is that black people have used Christianity to survive despite white supremacy. Right, he's like, we all know white supremacy exists and it's in these churches, it's in this, he called it white Christianity. There's a difference between real Christianity and white Christianity. And he called those white Christians antichrists, right? So he said, we can, we can separate, or can we? He took it as his personal mission to separate white supremacy from Christianity. That was his goal in doing liberation theology. And he said, I want to be able to redeem Christianity from white supremacist, white supremacy, from it as an evil, from, it, from that as a poison that permeates Christianity and all the world. And he said, I want to be a witness to the ways that black people have overcome in spite of, right? And the different creative ways and how black people continue to even love each other and do anything constructive. He says that, that bears acknowledgement and he wanted to be witness to that. So The Cross and the Lynching Tree is one of those, the books that we'll probably start with in our, in our reading group, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. So you want to go ahead and you can even just Google or not Google, but YouTube search the cross and the lynching tree, James Cohn, and start seeing some of his interviews and lectures he did on that book. Um, go to Amazon, order the book, um, get the get the Kindle, whatever you want to do. But it's a powerful, powerful book. And I'm reminded now in these days, following George Floyd's uh, murder, I'm reminded that you know, in his last utterances, he said. Mama, I'm gone, right? And Jesus on the cross said, it is finished. So what James Cone does is makes this correlation between the cross and the lynching tree because he's like, Jesus was a brown-skinned Palestinian minority who was executed on a tree, right? The cross was made out of wood, a tree, and black people since then have continued to be lynched in various ways from actual trees or on the street. Those are still lynchings, right? Uh, racially motivated, racially, murders from racial hatred is a lynching. It doesn't have to just be from a tree, right? But he's making, Cohen is making this correlation between the lynching tree of, um, the black experience and the cross that Jesus was crucified upon. So please keep in mind that the, 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 the crucifixion, all crucifixions, right? Jesus wasn't the only one crucified. That was a torture device of the Roman Empire that they used regularly. That was an execution by the state because Jesus was a revolutionary. We cannot forget that. White Christians would have us forget that. Right, so Cone makes that correlation in that book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. But here's a few things of what he has to say about um, from this particular one, uh, A Black Theology of Liberation. It's a little bit, a couple paragraphs. Unfortunately, American white theology has not been involved in the struggle for black liberation. It has been basically a theology of the white oppressor giving rebellious sanction to the genocide of Amerindians and the enslavement of Africans. From the very beginning to the present day, American white theological thought has been patriotic, so-called, either by defining the theological task independently of black suffering, which is the liberal northern approach, or by defining Christianity as compatible with white racism, which is the conservative southern approach. In both cases, theology becomes a servant of the state, and that can only mean death to blacks. 
It is little wonder that an increasing number of black religionists are finding it difficult to be black and be identified with traditional theological thought forms. He wrote this again in 1970. I'll just repeat it. It is little wonder that an increasing number of black religionists are finding it difficult to be black and be identified with traditional theological thought forms. The appearance of black theology on the American scene then is due primarily to the failure of white religionists to relate the gospel of Jesus to the pain of being black in a white racist society. It arises from the need of blacks to liberate themselves from white oppressors. Black theology is a theology of liberation because it is a theology which arises from an identification with the oppressed blacks of America seeking to interpret the gospel of Jesus in the light of the black condition. It believes that the liberation of the black community is God's liberation. The task of black theology then is to analyze the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the light of oppressed blacks so that we'll see the gospel as inseparable from their humiliated condition and as bestowing on them the necessary power to break the chains of oppression. This means that it is a theology of and for the black community seeking to interpret the religious dimensions of the forces of liberation in that community. So I read this so that you get an understanding of Cone's own understanding about why he remained Christian, right? He says, I won't let these uh, white supremacists have the religion. I won't let them have it. And I'm going to call them out for the Antichrist they are. Cone was a very passionate, uh, strong-minded, uh, powerful black theologian. And he approached his white colleagues very strongly and powerfully. I mean, they had all out arguments and, you know, disputes. If you can imagine these religion scholars sitting at their tables and in their classrooms, arguing it out. His white colleagues argued with him, you cannot do this. And he said, I will. And if you don't get it, you are a racist and you are an antichrist in a very literal way. You are the antichrist. So, you know, think about, you know, you went to your job and you went in there and called everybody antichrist, right? He talked, he said, I want to be able to finally be free enough to just say what black people wanted to say. So just one little bit here. More. White Americans try to convince themselves that they have been innocent onlookers of that history, but black Americans evaluate the history of this country differently. For them, white Americans have pursued two principal courses of action with regard to blacks. First, they decree that blacks were outside the realm of humanity, that blacks were animals, and that their enslavement was best for both for them and for society as a whole. And as long as black labor was needed, slavery was regarded as the appropriate solution to the black problem. I'm going to skip a little bit. Black theology is survival theology because it seeks to provide the theological dimensions of the struggle for black identity. So that's just a little bit. I don't want to go on just reading, but um, I do want to do that in our reading group. So let me know in the comments. Like, yes, I want to do the reading group. Yes, send me the link. Uh, because these times, I mean, like I told you, just reading Baldwin again, reading James Cone right now. Like they left us a legacy that is so rich now from the ancestral realm. They are present with us. They are present with us and asking us what we are going to do. They've given us so much. And so, you know, as I've said, even those who say I'm not Christian anymore, I wouldn't be Christian for anything. That's fine. I'm not trying to convert anybody, believe me. But I am saying that there are things in it. There's this liberationist uh, richness that is the, the revolution of, of, of black people who suffered under oppression for centuries. And our own uh, insistence on being free is still in, is still in there. So we can, we can discuss that. I wanna discuss that. So anyway, I hope you will share this video with people who you think will appreciate it. And uh, as always, I appreciate, appreciate you liking and subscribing and all that. So please do subscribe and hit the notification bell so you'll know when I come on with another video and you'll know when I'm going to do that class. I'm really, not too far from now, but I kind of want to give people a chance to get books or whatever they want to do. So 
maybe in like two sat week and a half at most. I don't know. Y'all let me know when you want to start. I might just start to tell you the truth because I'm feeling passionate about this right now. But y'all let me know what y'all want to do. Okay. So that's it. Bye for now.